the time has come for the revenge of the Sith. But we're not going to be talking about that. Instead, we're going to be talking about the Siege of Mandalore and the desired revenge of one former Sith. I'm John Barry, and today we are reviewing Star Wars The Clone Wars, Old Friends Not Forgotten. So it's hard to believe, but we are on the ninth episode of the seventh and final season of Star Wars The Clone Wars. It is quite impressive and kind of mind-blowing. Like, we're almost to the end. After this episode, there's only three more to go, and then we're done with The Clone Wars. And it's kind of a surreal feeling, um, but um, this episode, we know exactly where it takes place. The first two thirds of the film, or the film, I'll talk about that, of the episode take place prior to Revenge of the Sith. But the later third of the episode takes place concurrently with the opening of Revenge of the Sith. It, that is the legitimately what it is. We, in, we know this for a fact because about two thirds of the way through the episode, maybe a bit before that, um, these are just rough approximations, we get basically word that Coruscant is under attack and that Shakti has been sent to protect the Chancellor. That is all setting up Revenge of the Sith. And so we know what Anakin and Obi-Wan are doing, but what about Soka and Rex? Rex. Well, we find out in the later third of the episode, the last third of the episode. That's just mind-boggling, because overall, they never wasted a single minute. No, not even, no. They didn't waste a single second of screen time. Nearly every second on screen is used to convey something. It's advancing the story, or it's advancing character motivation and development. Nearly, they, I don't think, wasted anything at all. And, building off of that, it legitimately felt like a movie to me. That's why I accidentally said film earlier. It's because it legitimately felt like a film. Or, a, or maybe a miniseries might be more accurate, but it just had that feeling. I felt like I, like I could be watching this in the theater, like, stitch these four episodes together, even though I don't know what's coming yet, but stitch all four together, and sell some tickets in the theater, and I'll be there. Well, maybe not right now, um, but in the normal time, yeah. Like, this is Jim Default, very cinematic in how they presented it. And we really do see this in the opening. Because it differs from the rest of the Clone Wars, but in a good way. You know how normally at each episode of the Clone Wars in the beginning there's a little um, fortune cookie? Or is it something, some kind of words of advice or theme? Yeah, it's not here. Can't talk about it because it's legitimately not a part of this episode. But... What they did felt very much more cinematic rather than television. So, first of all, we open up, we get some musical cues. Kind of reminded me of a Soka theme. I'm not quite sure if I got that right, but it did remind me of Soka's theme. And it opens up on its, you know, black background and it says, A Lucasfilm Limited Productions. In green text. I don't know about you, but, um... That remind uh, maybe I don't know how well you can see that, but it reminded me of something. You know, I'm just saying it just reminded me of something. And then the musical cue changes, and it's not the Clone Wars theme. It's not the music they normally have in the intro for the Clone Wars. No, it's it is. The Star Wars theme, the main title theme that we hear at the start of every Star Wars film. No wonder I got that cinematic feeling to it. And then we see, not the Star Wars logo, no, we see the Clone Wars logo. Or the logo they've been using for the final season. And it's in red, so it's a bit different from a Star Wars film. I do kind of like that, because um, most Star Wars films use yellow, and I said solo, and then they used blue. And they did a couple other weird stuff in Solo. But it was, I have a whole video talking about the intro of Solo. So um, go check that out if you're interested. But um, getting back to the Clone Wars. 
So it go it receives back with like the clones logo normally does, so it's not scrolling like the Star Wars logo does in the film in the Star Wars films. Once the logo disappears out of frame because it's it you no know, went all the way back, I half expected there to be a crawl because the music continued. And then we get on screen it says part one, it fades out and then we get the title of the episode, Old Friends Not Forgotten. That is, I think, the only, only time I have ever seen the Clone Wars, the name, the title of the Clone Wars episode actually appear on screen before the episode. Even in the Clone Wars movie, which you, which I have right here, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's, it, the knife, it felt more television rather than movie, and this was a mo and that was a movie. This is clearly television, but it feels more like a movie. But yeah, the ep the intro was so different yet so perfect. Like they really, they flown in everyone else at Lucasfilm Animation. They really went out in making this feel as much like a movie as possible. And then, as I said earlier, there was no crawl, but. Like every episode of the Clone Wars, we do get the, you know, kind of the recap. It's um, um, the actor who voices um, Admiral Yarin, whose name is forget it's slipping my head. Tom King, I think. If it's wrong, I'll correct myself. But anyhow, that appears. So it does have no more Clone Wars stuff. And it very much sets up not, not only the episode, but also Revenge of the Sith. We see both Plo Koon and Ada Sakura on the planet that they will be on. Doing Odo 66. And it's secure is on Fuchsia. And I think Plo Koon happens to... Is, I think it's Keitu Nimodia. If I think. I'm not quite sure I could have that wrong. But like, same... Like, it's like, scary. Like, when I saw Ada Sakura, like, no, 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 no. Because the scene was shot nearly identical to the clone... To Odo 66. It was amazing how they did that frame. It was only like, three seconds. But yeah, I had that going through my head. Not so much with Plo Koon, only because it was a, clearly a different shot of Ada Secure. Man, that shot was very similar. Anyhow, in one scene, we also get a shot of a young Caleb Doom. And if you don't know who that is, maybe you'll know him better as Kenan Jarvis from Star Wars Rebels. And also his master, um, Deborah Balaba, is also there. It's just a quick shot. Nothing really special about it, but I did like that they were able to include a connection to Star Wars Rebels. Of course, it's not the only connection to Star Wars Rebels, no. As I said, this is the opening to the Siege of Mandalore arc, and well, we get some Mandalorian cards. First of all, it's in dialogue confirmed that one of the Mandalorians al aligned with bo is Ursa Ren. Book 10 calls her Ursa, so we know for sure. And I gotta say, Sabine's probably like a baby, so, right now, because I'm just saying, that's, I'm just saying, because she's about, yeah. Yeah, I'm going off a tangent here, but obviously we know who, obviously we know that um, Sabine's father's looking after her right now, because her mother's in the fight. Also among the, the, among, also among the Mandalorians that are supporting Maul, well, of course, we get Saxon, which it has to be Gar Saxon. There's really no other possible Saxon at this point in the timeline who that could be. Now, I spent some good time talking about just the intro to the episode and some connections. But, um, let's actually talk about the animation text before we actually, actually talk about the story of the episode. Because there was just so much to talk about. The animation is spectacular. I mean, it is gorgeous. There is this one shot of General Grievous doing the the opening recap of what's been going on previously in the galaxy. General Grievous looks better than he does in Revenge of the Sith. He looks better than he's ever done. He is at his most menacing I've ever seen him on screen, excluding video games. But I think even more menacing. Like, I was, like, you've probably seen the images I'm showing up here, but, like, he looks better than he's done in previous episodes of Clone Wars and in Revenge of the Sith, in my opinion, at least. And I see this just a testament to how superb the animation is. And, I, 
the animation, I would say, is better than nearly every episode of the song was previously, including previous episodes in this own season. Because I remember when you know, the Bad Bad Shark started coming out, and, or came out, and we were all talking about how great the animation is. Um, the animation here, I think, is even better than that. They, they are really, you know, on the game for the animation, and I hope they keep it up. Uh, if you remember earlier, I said this episode had a very cinematic feel to it. I think the animation is a, is a contributor to that. Just great animation tends to portray itself to more the silver screen to the movie theater rather than the television screen. But we should probably get into more of the nitty gritty of this excellent, excellent episode. But first, there is one more connection I would like to talk about. Fulcrum. If you didn't watch Star Wars Web with Fulcrum was Ahsoka's code name um, before she revealed herself to the Ghost crew. But also, um, Agent Kaz took up the mon moniker of Fulcrum after Ahsoka's apparent death on Malico. And um, that was when, he, in just some context, Kaz became a double agent and... Basically, he ultimately loyal to the rebels instead of the empire, and then we also learn it's used as for more than one um, rebel spy as well during that time. But we kind of get its origin, and it involves Saw Gerrera. Yeah, I honestly didn't expect that. But apparently, Fulcrum was a originally at least a subspace frequency that. Um, that obviously was used for communication with Saul Guerrero originally. Um, the way Admiral Yarn phrased it when contacting Anakin to inform him that Ahsoka was contact contacting him, it made it sound like either Anakin owns this subspace frequency or, or somehow created and made it or found it and named it. Again, it's kind of iffy, but it's clearly connected with Anakin and Saul Guerrero, probably set up. You know, during the, during the arc where they trained Saw and some other Onderon, Onderanians. How do you, I know it's, for Onderon it's Onderanians, but what about Onderon, Onderanians? I don't know, but training basically, rub, the, oh, basically were, became the partisans and the rebels later on in the timeline. So, if, so man, just, just put that into context. For stuff and doing rebels, Fulcrum is is fully fighting against in every sense the person who helped create it. Just think of that in more than one ways by the time of rebels. But that was just um, nice. And apparently, I'm um, Saul is still fighting the separatists on on Dron. Well, we do know that he was basically very much um battle hardened by his appearance. Any time after her, his first appearance, appearance, so there is that. But of course, Ahsoka was on that mission to train Saw and the pre the precursors of who would become the partisans, and so Ahsoka, of course, would know their subspace frequency, and she used it to contact Anakin and Obi Wan. And that's act how she does get in contact with Anakin and Obi Wan. But um, just for some context, of first, the first I would say about a third of the episode is. Is a badge that has nothing really to do with the Siege of Mandal. Just you know, a new offensive that the Septus are going on. Probably as a distraction so they can actually attack Coruscant. That I mentioned earlier. As I said, there's a lot going on in this episode. They really don't waste anything. But so, basically, Command and Code D over one of the rest of the two or twelve are basically pinned down. And apparently, the Five of and Anakin can get their battle done. And of course, Rex. And so they come to help out. Well, so the rest, all the five of us, including Rex and R two D two, are hiding under the bridge that that um the, uh, that the battle is on. Oh, it's a choke point, I guess, and the Republic's trying to push their way through. Well, Anakin, meanwhile, is just up on top, not taking cover like you no know, Obi Wan, Cody, and the rest of the two, the two hundred twelfth are. Like you no, know, he's just a just moving slightly out of way when a blaster bolt comes his way, like being being reckless. And we do see, I think, this was very much written to show Anakin's a bit more reckless. And then so he goes to basically distract 
the um, droids and get the tactical droid to come out of his sheltered place so that way he can take the tactical droid out. And how does he do it? Well, I do want to say there's a lot of um, parallels, rhyming if you will, to the Clone Wars movie that I mentioned earlier. Basically, in if you remember the Clone Wars movie, Obi-Wan pretends to surrender his troops in order to basically delay the Separatists for as long as possible. Here, what does Anakin do? He pretends he wants to surrender. And Cosino basically tries, tries to flatter the Separatists and all that to get the Separatist tactical droid to come out. And it does, and immediately the tactical droid is like, Open fire! It's, it's a trick! I'm not sure exactly what he said. I know he, the tactical droid didn't say it's a trap, or maybe he did, I don't know. But it's like, very much the tactical droid knew exactly what Anakin was doing. Anakin used the force to pull the tactical droid and dis dismantle it. But then, meanwhile, the Rex and the rest of the five were first get the, hear the signal from Anakin and they activate their jetpacks and they go flying and destroying. If you remember from the Clone Wars movie, Rex and the small detachment of the five were first also use a very similar tactic in order to flank. Uh, in the, oh, they use jetpacks, not a similar tactic. I guess they're just similar for them, minus the Anakin part. But use jetpacks basically to flank the enemy to incapacitate some of the more heavy ordnance. And well, the five were first basically pushes, is able to push the separatists back. And then just, you can. Also tell a little bit about more about Anakin and Obi-Wan's friendship here. Because, you know, Anakin says, You guys is you not know, being very wo worn down. Help make the fake surrender look more real. Which is just kind of funny. But um, I do want to say, this I think was a lot to show more of Anakin's restlessness than anything else. Not restlessness, but recklessness. Um, but that how confident he is. And then that's when... Anakin and Obi-Wan get the transmission from Ahsoka, they go back to the ship, they have a conversation, and then they eventually meet up, and basically Ahsoka and Bo-Katan are saying, hey, we need your guys' help in order to combat the, uh, combat Maul, because we figure out he's on Menlo, we get a shout out to the Ahsoka walkabout arc, and her being held by the Pikes. Anakin's like, I'm ready to help. Me meanwhile, Obi-Wan's like, well, I'm not so sure. The Jedi Council will have to approve. And also, we do have those treaties with Mandalore. And so, I just speaking of those treaties, it kind of sounds like those treaties prevent the Republic from interfering in any internal Mandalorian affair. If you remember back to the very first Mandalorian-centric episodes of the Clone Wars, it was all basically... Satine travels to Coruscant basically to argue that what's going on is an internal Mandalorian affair. The Death Watch aren't backed by the Scepters, even though they were. But basically saying the Republic doesn't actually need to get involved. So I do find that kind of interesting, how that all kind of connects. Like, apparently the Republic is, by treaty and law, unable to actually be allowed to intervene in Mandalorian affairs. I guess Maul does kind of sway wrench and all this. But um, what does end up happening? Well, Ahsoka and the detachment of the 501st led by Rex do end up going. But there's a few things I want to lay down first. First of all, Obi-Wan does admit that Satine was special to him. But also, he, but he also says he cannot let his emotions cloud his judgment. Which I think is there to serve very much a contrast to... Anakin who does let his emotions. Because I think Obi-Wan's emotions, where he doesn't let them cloud his judgment, doesn't mean they don't influence. Because when Anakin basically says, I'll send a detachment in the 501st, I'll create, oh, like, create a new detachment or a division of the 501st and give Ahsoka command so, she, so that way they can go do it. Obi-Wan's like, but technically Ahsoka's not part of the Jedi anymore and doesn't hold any actual authority. So what does Anakin say? Fine, I'll just promote Rex to commando and give him command of the new division and assign Ahsoka as an advisor. Boom. And Obi-Wan doesn't object to that. But uh, Obi-Wan accepts that plan pretty readily. Which I think does show a little bit that while his emotions may not cloud his judgment and make and allow him to make reckless decisions on like 
Anakin. That doesn't mean he doesn't doesn't mean his emotions don't impact his decision making. He just doesn't let them rule his decision making. Rex gets promoted to commander, and I gotta say, Commander Rex. I just don't know. I'm so used to Captain Rex, and I give and in Rebels too. He at the very end he is referred to as Commander by Sabine in her epilogue monologue, but um. Most of the other time he is called Captain, but then again, he may just prefer being called Captain because it's always in character dialogue, characters talking to other characters, him talking, introducing himself. It's really never somebody talking about him, and you no, know, that's what I'm getting at. He still, I think he still considers himself a Captain, because let's also remember, in Rebels, he still calls Ahsoka Commando. And actually, in this episode, the clones are still calling Ahsoka Commando, even though she's technically no longer part of the Jedi Order, and no longer their Commando, but the clones are still calling her Commando. Which I think says a lot. Um, and they're also saluting her, showing her you no know, respect. And it's amazing, and she said she doesn't deserve this anymore. But Ahsoka... Uh, nah, Ahsoka... But Anakin basically tells her they respect you. This is how they're showing it. And a lot of people talk about mo mo when people talk about soldiers, they talk about why soldiers fight. Regardless of the bigger causes of the of whatever war it is, the soldiers' utmost loyalty are always to their fellow soldiers. The war could be about something else, but the soldiers tend to have more loyalty to each other, their comrades in arms. And that's very much shown on here. The if you know if you pay attention to the Clone Wars, the clones consider each other brothers. Yeah, it is very much the clones. This camaraderie does extend to their Jedi, and even if the Jedi are no longer Jedi, the the respect there and they are still they still have loyalty to their fellow their fellow comrades in arms. Now, that is kind of sad with all the 66 how that go goes. But if we remember, some, at least one clone was able to snap out of it, um, in, in, um, in one of the comics detailing Kanan's Ken, life in the, right before and during and after Order 66. I haven't read that comic yet, but I do know about it, and one clone does snap out of it, meaning, the clones do have it in the capability because of basically knowing the Jedi so well and considering the, the Jedi their comrades in arms that it is potential for them to snap out of Order 66. Now, the question is what's going to happen if all the clones are Mandalore with Ahsoka because if they still consider her a Jedi and that probably means Order 66 will still target her. Now, do some snap out of it? Maybe. What about Rex? Well, if you know my theory, which I've plugged a couple times before, but I'm going to plug again, I think Captain Rex's inhibitor chip never worked, meaning he was never compelled to obey Order 66, and I think he would know that Order 66 made no sense. He may play along when he receives the communication from the Chancellor, or the Emperor at that point, I guess, <laughs> but very much when that happens, I don't think he is going to be forced. Maybe, I just don't think because of my Syria. I'm getting starting to get the feeling I could be wrong about the, my feeling, but I hope my theory is correct. But I, I would like to see cl other clones like, no, just a single clone here and there, especially some of the clones who have been in the Clone Wars the longest, kind of break from their control and help the Jedi before they are gunned down alongside the Jedi. Because I kind of hope for an Order 66 montage again. Just showing some other characters that we didn't get to see, and maybe some more showing that not every clone was carried through it. Because I just would love that, but that's getting kind of off topic, and there's still, still so much I need to talk about. But, um, I actually want to talk about the detachment of the five of force that goes to Mandalore. First of all, they are using jetpacks, which, as I talked about the scene earlier, where the five of force used jetpacks earlier, that obviously set up that they know how to use jetpacks. 
And actually that scene of the clones basically landing on Menzo does very much remind me of of Star Wars Rebels. You know, everyone has a jetpack except for the one Jedi. And the, Jedi, and the one Jedi is like, I don't need, need the, a jetpack and happens to do better than those with a jetpack. I'm talking about Kanan, not Ezra, who gets a jetpack and is not very good at using it. But yeah, they land on Mandalorian fight, and it's a pretty good detachment division. They even got capital ship support. They got support from a fleet, so they're obviously well equipped. But let's not talk about some other aspects of the episode. Prime Minister Armak is still in charge of Mendo after Maul installed him after killing Pre Vizsla, and apparently he has his own Mandalorian suit of armor. So I gotta say. He's clearly not that skilled at combat because, yeah, Bo-Katan and the Mandalorians who, attack, who went to the throne room with Fo very quickly apprehend him and subdue him. Don't know if they killed him or not, I don't remember. But the other Mandalorians there, yeah, they kicked him out pretty well. And, uh, basically, the more Mandalorians are taken out by Bo-Katan's Mandalorians pretty quickly. Well, because the best ones went down into basically the sewers of the city where Maul was hiding, and basically to lower the Jedi down there. And the Jedi he wanted was, you guessed it, Obi-Wan. Instead he gets Ahsoka. And actually, this is how the episode ends. It ends on a cliffhanger. Maul stepping out of the shadows, talking to Ahsoka, basically asks her, why is she there? Basically. Basically, he wants to know why Obi-Wan isn't there, but obviously he's being smart enough not to say it. But the episode ends on that cliffhanger. And man, I can't believe how much they packed into the episode. Yeah. Originally going into this episode, I was expecting us to get into the Siege of Mendel arc rather quickly into actual fighting on Mendel. Which we actually did, but I expected that earlier in the episode when I, went in, when I didn't get it, I expected, well, this is all going to be setting up that stuff. No, we get it. So that, just um, how much story is there to tell? I said, they're not letting a single second go to waste. And I think that's going to be very much the case. I have a feeling the next episode is going to be a lot of more of what's going on in Mandalore. Fighting between, a duo, at least one duo between Ahsoka and Maul. Probably Maul dropping some hint about Palpatine's greater plan to Ahsoka. You know, especially if he knows why... Obi Wan isn't there. Probably some comment like I would have, like <laughs> maybe some comment like, I hope I get to do it for Obi Wan first. Just some weird offhand comment, dark comment. I'm just expecting that. I'm expect, and then so in that is the last episode, second to last episode. I think we're going to get Order sixty six. I'm not sure, but man, are they putting a lot, a lot, in here? And I really can't wait to see what happens. There is a lot going on in this episode with Jam Peg. This is probably my longest review for an episode of the Clone Wars yet. And I would say it is worth it. I'm also sure I've missed stuff. So if I have, um, let me know. So thank you for watching my review. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to leave a like if you haven't done so already. Or if you prefer, dislike it. It's all engagement anyhow. Also, be sure to check out my social media, Facebook and Twitter. Links are in the description as are the links from my Discord server which is a great place to just chat if you would like to join there. Or my Patreon page if you would like to support my channel. This is also my merch store down there if you are so interested. And if you have not yet done so, please subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you can be notified of when my latest content comes out. Be sure to check out the video or the playlist on screen now. And as always, have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the force be with you, always.